<laughs> Welcome to Trash Talk MMA. Smile on my face behind my back and talk trash. The number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. <laughs> Brought to you live and unfiltered from all four corners of the globe by MMA aficionado Antoine Pelchay. Yo, and welcome to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelchay, and today I have two distinguished guests, Mr. Travis Luter, former UFC middleweight contender and winner of the Ultimate Fighter Season 4, and Jiu-Jitsu ace Paul Halmy. How you doing, guys? Doing good. Doing good. Excellent. What brings uh, what brings you fine gentlemen to uh, to Phuket, Thailand? Uh, we uh, we were supposed to film a documentary with Stuart Cooper, um, and then uh, and then the other thing that we're doing is doing seminars and then sightseeing. So, excellent. So, what was the what's the basis of this documentary? Is it something that's been in the work for for a while? Uh, we've talked about it on and off, you know, over the years and stuff like that. And it's just a just to documentary I guess on me yeah uh, your jiu-jitsu history yeah my jiu-jitsu history there you go okay yeah it's funny you brought up Stuart Cooper because I was just uh, a lot of the Tiger Muay Thai guys have have some promotional videos done by him and, yeah. and, and they're really slick pieces of work where, where is he based out of uh, England he's based out of England okay yeah I like his work I'd like to uh, I'll be curious to see when he gets that done and check that out so Travis um, I'm not gonna lie man when I was walking around you know, Tiger Muay Thai, and I saw that uh, you were coming to do a seminar. I was uh, I was pleased because it's been a long time since I've had any any news from you. What's uh, what's been keeping you busy since uh, you know since you've retired from MMA? Uh, just you know, training jiu jitsu, uh, running my gyms, uh, doing that stuff. You know, we go to we go to a bunch of tournaments over the course of the year. You know, we always go to Worlds, uh, the Adult Worlds. We always go to. Masters Worlds, we always go to Nogi Worlds, uh, and then you know a bunch of other tournaments that we go to. So we follow the Jiu Jitsu scene pretty close, and uh, you know, and stay involved in that. Okay. Um, so you're out here doing a, a seminar at Tiger Muay Thai as well. Yes. That's going to happen this afternoon. Uh, what, what takes place in those, and what's uh, what are your individual roles, Travis and Paul? I'm just going to go out there, and uh, I'll probably you know start off you know make introductions. Uh, you know, remind people who I am, and then uh, we'll probably work some passing the guard. Uh, you know, mixing in some strikes along the way, and then we'll once we go to the guard, um, pass the guard, then we'll, you know, probably gonna work the way that I hold the back and try to work my finishes from there. Um, and then if we cover all that in the two hours, then we'll probably uh, um, add in what I do from the guard from an MMA perspective. You know, and. Uh, on the way that I play and stuff like that. So. Okay, so it's definitely a jiu-jitsu class tailored for usage in MMA? Yes. Okay. All right, so speaking of, uh, speaking with Paul earlier when we were, when we just got here, you mentioned that you'd, you know, you'd cornered little Travis in a lot of his fights, and one thing I sort of wanted to, to revisit was that uh, you didn't have the longest MMA career, uh, 16 fights, but you had a lot of notable names on your, you know, on your yeah. resume. So, you know, you fought Jorge Rivera, Marvin Eastman, Matt Lindlin, Trevor Prangley, uh, Pele, Patrick Cote, Rich Franklin, and of course uh, the great Anderson Silva. Yeah. How was it? Uh, what was it like being in the corner for some of these fights, Paul? It was cool. It was a cool experience. One thing about Travis, he didn't take easy fights where a lot of guys would. No, I mean he was one of those. Are. You know, so it makes for an interesting career, and it was a lot of fun. I got to see a lot of cool things and take part of a lot of really cool training camps, and then the fights, of course, you know, were amazing. Now, Travis, is this something that you wanted to do right out the gate when you got into MMA? Did you want to take big fights right away? I mean, you got thrown into some pretty deep waters pretty quick. You got to remember, it's like I started biting. My first fight was in 1998. Uh, and that's, you know, I, I don't know when they started doing weight classes, but I think it was you know, after that that they started adding in, into the UFC weight classes. And it's like, you know, at first they only had the 205 pound weight class and stuff like that. And then, uh, um, by the time I made it to the UFC, that's 2004, um, you know, then they had, you know, 170, 185, and 205 weight classes, but that's all they had at that time, you know, so it was a, you know, it was a lot different. I just wanted to fight, you know, it's like my my original goal was to be, you know, 185 pound, but world champion. My, my, I wanted to be the toughest man alive, you know, and then uh, over the course of the few years, you go, okay, I'm not quite big enough to be the toughest man alive, so I'll be whatever weight class I can fight at. Yep. And I fought at 205, I fought at 185, 
um, you know, I competed in jiu-jitsu against, you know, um, the really, really big guys. So it's like the, the goal was always just to, to just be the best. That was, that was, uh, it wasn't ever about, you know, weight classes and stuff like that. It's, it's a, you know, it's a different feel when you're talking to the modern generation, you're talking about, you know, it's like I started doing MMA, you know, shortly after the UFC, you know, it's like, I think the first UFC was in 1993. Uh, 1993 and it's like uh, 22 yeah 22 years old yeah and it's like I fought in UFC 50 and we're at one, UFC 185 or something like that now that's a that's a lot of evolution a lot of different changes and stuff like that you know so it's like uh, you know I, the goal was to be you know like Hoist Gracie and fight everybody that, that's a great segue for what I want to talk about next. Uh, you, you entered the world of fighting through wrestling. Uh, you've wrestled since you're 12, correct? Mm, yeah, I think 12. Yeah. Okay. And then it seems that once you saw Royce Gracie fight, that your fascination turned to jiu-jitsu quite quickly. Yeah, I was done with wrestling then. So what is it you saw there that, 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 that fired that up in you? It was just he was beating wrestlers that were better than I was at the time. Uh, you know, it's like uh, you got a big... You know, it's like when he beat Dan Severin, you yep. know, it's like Dan Severin's a big, really, really decorated wrestler that, you know, it's like this is, now his his best years in wrestling were behind him, but he was still just a beast and a big, big man, and it's like, and Hoist caught him at around 12 or 15 minutes into the fight, and he caught him in that triangle. Um, that was, you know, it's like that was a motivation, you know, it's like, okay, I want to do that, and it's like, um, you know, so that, that was my goal. So, I mean, as a kid, was it something that you saw that you saw, like, fascinated with, I guess, perhaps smaller guys beating up bigger guys? No, I mean, you, know? you didn't see that. You know, it's <laughs> like, you know, you got to think back. It's like I was 24 years old and, and uh, uh, well, 1993, I guess I would have been 20, 20 years old, 21 years old when the first yeah. UFC came out. Uh, you know, it's like by the time I moved to Texas, I was 24 years old. Yeah, it's like my heroes, you know, it's like I didn't grow up with the MMA heroes. I, I, I like boxing. I read a lot about boxing and stuff like that. Uh, um, as a kid, but in South Dakota, there's no place to box. Uh, you know, so I never, you know, so I wrestled. And it, it wasn't about, you know, it was just, you know, it was about, you know, I remember when Mike Tyson won the world championship and when I was in high school, he was 18 or 19 years old, I think 19 years old when yep. he won the yeah, heavyweight yeah. world championship. And it's like, okay, that's who I want to be. I want to be like that. And that, that was my motivation. I wanted to be the toughest man alive because that was who it was. Like Mike. Mike. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think uh, we all can recall those those good old days, and that's really when boxing was, you know, was the shit. That's when yeah. people were really excited no. to tune in. No, nineteen you know? seventies. This, you know, the yeah, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. It's like this is before our time and stuff like that. And I think that's the the golden age of boxing was the seventies. It's like okay. you had two undefeated champions fighting each other and. Uh, um, in uh, Muhammad Ali and uh, Joe Frazier in 19, what was that, 1972, 1971. Uh, and it's like, you know, it's like there were two, the two guys, it's like that were undefeated going out there and, you know, plowing into each other and Joe Frazier knocking him down in the 14th round or 15th yeah. round, 15th yeah. round, uh, winning the fight and then, uh, you know, going on to lose the fight to George Foreman, uh, another undefeated heavyweight at the time. You know, so then you had two undefeated guys. They weren't, you know, George was not a former uh, champion. He was Olympic champion, but it's like, that's the golden time, I think, for boxing, if, if not the 80s. Yeah. I mean, I'm, how old are you? I'm uh, 30, uh, 40, 41. I'm 41, 42. I'm 39. 39. Paul, yeah. yeah, so I mean, what I meant from uh, the Tyson era was that's the era that I remember as a kid yeah, yeah, growing yeah. up. I didn't, yeah. I, it's interesting because I've always been in, interested in combat sports, but boxing has never been a passion of mine. Are you guys pretty adamant, you know, pretty I like men I, boxing I, I've read a crazy amount about boxing, you know, from the beginning of boxing until uh, till now, and I follow it pretty closely. It's like a, I'm, I'd much rather read about it than I would uh, watch it, so. Okay. Yeah. Are you guys excited about this Pacquiao Mayweather fight? No. <laughs> what a few years ago would have been a lot yeah, better. Yeah, it would have been great a couple of years ago. So what do you think is taking a bit of the luster away from this fight? And Pacquiao's lost twice. Yes. <laughs> That's pretty easy. <laughs> and once of them quite violently. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah it's like, that was a brutal knockout. Yeah, it's yeah. like, it is, so it's, you know. You put them together both undefeated and it's the biggest. Well, uh, he, Pacquiao was never undefeated. He's well, got four losses. But, but, so yeah. it's like, yeah. um, you know, he lost as a 112-pounder. Uh, he got knocked out as a 112-pounder. Think about that. 
Do you guys still think it'll be the biggest fight ever in boxing in terms of numbers? They charge so much for the stuff. It's got to be. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. You know, it's like they, it's like you know, UFC went up on its pay per view price. I think ten bucks now. Yeah. Another ten bucks. Uh, you know, it's like it's uh, yeah, it's like it's easier to do big numbers when you keep it up on the price. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, yeah, the UFC shows. There's a lot of them out now too, man. It's not just you know, it's not just that they bumped up the price. They bumped up the output. It's becoming hard to follow. You know, yeah, it's, it's it's hard to keep up. You know, it's like it's, if you want to sit there and watch everyone, I don't even attempt. You know, it's like I watch. You know, I might watch a free one, maybe. Uh, so you don't watch pay per views. And then if I if I go with my school, my gym, I'll go watch it. Or if somebody invites me over and hey, you want to come watch the fight? Oh, who's fighting? And it's like, uh, oh yeah, I'll come over. Nah, you know, it's like I don't really care to see Ronda Rousey beat up somebody, so I'll skip this one. <laughs> Oh, that fight was just deplorable. I was just, I was like, wow, that was the biggest brain. Did you see that fight? I saw it. I saw, I saw it on Instagram. I saw it, on <laughs> yeah. Instagram. it fits on Instagram. Yeah, it that, is. That, 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 the whole fight's on Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. And you're like, why would she do that? Like, that was the biggest brain fart in title fight history. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, there's, it, it, you've got, you know, yeah, it's, Ronda's really good. Yeah, she is really good. Incredibly good. So Travis, your last UFC fight was versus Rich Franklin in April 2008. After that, you took two more fights, one against uh, Jason McDowell, I believe in MFC. Yeah, like Jason McDowell. Yep. And then uh, your last fight was against uh, Rafael Natal in May of 2010, and you've been retired since. What uh, what brought that on? I, I know you, you were a victim of some, or you were suffering from some neck injuries. I, I hurt my neck real bad uh, um, before the Rich Franklin fight, and we had to postpone the fight. Um, and then... Uh, um, you know, and then it was it was okay. I, I don't think I was ever quite the same after after I hurt my neck. Um, and then I, I hurt it again really really bad right before five days before the not the, the tall fight. The tall fight. Uh, um, I hurt it really bad. I fractured a vertebrae. It turned out I didn't have it until afterwards that um, I have it looked at. And uh, um, you know, so I fractured a vertebrae. I had three three uh, bulging discs. I had narrowing of the nerve pathways and some other craps. That was wrong with it so I had a three level fusion you know it's like the only other guy that I've heard about having a three level fusion was this uh, boss written boss had a three level because didn't uh, Nate Corey that was his back that's his back that's his mid back or low back okay um, and me and uh, you know are, is in our neck you know, they, so don't, right. like, they don't do that surgery yet like he did on his back they can't do it for the yeah they can't yet. do that they can't, can't do that surgery that. Okay. on your neck yet so so obviously that was the key reason that prompted you to retire as a professional yeah player. yeah yeah i was done you know, okay like, how are you yeah. feeling now i feel okay i had the surgery uh i waited a while to have it and uh you know i feel okay you know it's like yeah i read i read leading up to it that you wanted to try to treat this naturally you, you wanted to avoid surgery i read an interview of you of you saying that is that a philosophy yeah, that you followed for a certain i just don't like surgery i don't like I, I don't have an acl in my uh right knee i i, I I uh, busted it in 2003, and I've never had it fixed. I had one scope in like 2006, Six, I think. 2006 or seven. I had it scoped, and they, uh, you know, and I wouldn't let them fix the ACL. I just, I just cleaned it out. Um, I just don't like surgeries. It's like, you know, they're. Uh, I just think that the. The damage that they do sometimes you know fixing stuff and it's like taking the time off would have been killer for my career at that point in time yep. and uh you know I, I didn't realize at the time that it was over because uh, <laughs> my neck anyway so it wouldn't have mattered but it would have killed the career and yeah. so i just opted not to have the acl surgery it doesn't give me any problems it's like it's it's a little bit looser but you know it's like i've got really strong hamstrings so i just don't worry about it, it doesn't bother me in jiu-jitsu i got my guard works just fine and you know, it's like uh, I don't like to run anyway. So, so are you in any pain? Uh, my neck or, or discomfort? Oh, uh, well, especially my the neck, neck hurts. Yeah. You know, every day, every day the neck yeah. hurts. But you know, it's like it is what it is. I, don't, um, you know, I train jujitsu. I, I wrestle occasionally, not a lot anymore, um, because that hurts it. Um, I don't, I don't spar anymore because that hurts it. Um, and it's not the direct blow that hurts it. It's when it gets bumped. It's just like a, yeah. You know, it's like when somebody just. You know, it's just bump like or grazing, or it's like a you know, 
like a really like when the planes bump them uh, hits the turbulence, turbulence. Yep. messes up my neck terrible because it's just the shaking and it's right. just uh, so it's just those aftershocks or something like that bothers it a lot so it's okay though so I mean at that time and you had a you had a, a good momentum going you were fighting professionally you were fighting in the UFC were you really how did you deal with this psychologically like did you feel like hey this is my bread and butter I got to keep doing this how did you keep no I was running my gyms I was still running my gyms and stuff like that you know so it's like the gyms were going well and uh, in 2006 2007 I, I had probably you know two of my best years ever uh, with the gyms and then uh, in 2008 you know the economy kind of tanked. Um, so we then we really really started focusing on the gyms both Paul and I he's got he's got a gym too so it's like we both really focused on uh, learning and getting better as far as running our business and it's like I make way more money now than I did in 2006 and 2007 uh, you <laughs> yeah. know off of running my gym uh, we had a, a downturn last year but it's like I still it's way better than that so it's more profitable than fighting. <laughs> it's way more profitable. Nobody hits me in the head. And nobody on the internet calls me names, usually. So <laughs> so you don't miss it? No. Okay. Now, you two go way, way back, right? I mean, how long have you guys been friends for? 20-some years. 22 years. 22 years. You guys were buddies. Did you go to school together? Met in college. Okay. College, yeah. And then you guys have just been training together, competing, yeah, supporting moved, each other, competing. Moved Texas together, train together, compete together, do a lot of things together. So yeah, Paul was a golfer in college. He was a very good golfer. Yeah, and it was a big so it's change. like he didn't have any wrestling background and stuff like like that. So it's like you know, and when he moved to Texas, then he he got into training and stuff like that. But it just took longer for him to develop than uh, than a guy with a wrestling background. But Paul's really really good. You know, just beat Babalu at the. Um, Masters Nogi Worlds, uh, you know, so it's like he, he's really, really good. That's, that's so, fun. do you still compete in any capacity, Travis? I'm supposed to do the oh, the Masters Seniors Worlds, no, just, just Masters, just Masters, Masters, Masters. Masters. It's it's just seniors. Masters Worlds now uh, <laughs> in September's uh, my goal right now. Okay, now so. do you have opponents lined up for that already? No, nah, Jiu-Jitsu is different. You just sign up for the tournament. Yep. You go do it. It's the IBJJF. It's not like. It's not like MMA. You just uh, you just show up, and pay your money, and you go out there compete. They see uh, the bracket. And they see the bracket. And you, go. Okay. you just go. Okay. Like a wrestling tournament. Yeah. Right. So, Paul, how about you? You. I mean, are you, it's competing. Are you still competing professionally? Um, just in jiu-jitsu currently is my favorite thing now. It's like I'll be 40 this year, so just always trying to do the best we can. Like in the international tournaments, Travis and I have been. Japan, Brazil, basically beat all over. Um, and then winning the Worlds last year was a big thing for me, winning it in no Gi Worlds. So like this year, the big goal is to try to win it in Gi Worlds okay. so for Masters Division. So it's fun because Jiu Jitsu is a great outlet for competitive people because they break everything down by you know age groups. So you have 30 to 35, 36 to 40, 40. So you got guys that are 50, 60 years old, black belts, you know, fifth, sixth degree black belts competing still against each other. It's awesome to see. So it gives you a hope. Where you don't have to stop competing, you can keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and, and you run into some really big, some big names too that are competing in the masters divisions yeah. now. You have like Babalu, you have um, Sean Gibero, yeah, Saul Libero. I mean, you got like yeah, yeah, there's a lot of big names, a lot of big names. And what's the uh, what's the grappling tournament now that the that the Gracies are running there? Metamorris. Metamorris. Yeah. You guys interested in that? You know. I don't know, if they wanted to, yeah, that'd be great. You know, it's like I, I'd for sure do Metamorphs. Um, but Probably be a great fit for you. Yeah, it'd be fun. I'd definitely do Metamorphs. That'd yeah. be fun. And I beat Babalu, and he's doing Metamorphs yeah. again. Yeah, Babalu, <laughs> yeah, Babalu did that. He's fighting Sonin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I beat Babalu yeah. just in yeah. November. Okay. So. Yeah, they just announced that like last week, yeah. right? Uh-huh. Okay. It's so interesting, was- yeah. Good old Joe Sonin. Yeah. <laughs> One, one thing that people don't talk a lot about with Travis's history, too, is he won the Gracie Challenge. They had one, like the big, big one, that was kind of set up for the Gracies to win, and Travis actually won the whole thing, so you will not find a video about it. Yeah, there's <laughs> so no video. Probably it was in 2003. It's like it was... Uh, Alio was there. Jeff Monson was in it. Jeff yep. Monson, David Avalon, uh, the Henner and Haran Gracie were yep. in it. It was an eight-man tournament. There were some other that guys. Sambo guy fought me, the first round. And then me, and it's like, uh, and then I won it, and that was the last one. And, and it, it, uh, back then it was it, it was huge. It was a big deal compared to big like Metamorphs when you got like five thousand dollars. It was yeah. like five grand to win. It was back like in the nineties. Yeah, well, no, it was two thousand three. Two thousand three. You had Alio there, and then um, yeah. the big guy who passed away from the Green Mile what was. It? Oh yeah, Michael um, Clark. Michael Clark, Clark, Clark Duncan. Clark. All these guys and, were there, uh, front and center. Ed O'Neill was there. Um, 
Yeah, um, Michael Clark Duncan. He was a big fan. You used to always see him front row yeah, at the UFC. Yeah, yeah, it was. He was. Uh, he was there. So it was. Like, see Juliet Lewis. Mm-hmm. Juliet Lewis. There's no video of that tournament. tournament. <laughs> yeah, I never saw the video. Nobody wants to see that video. Uh, maybe him or Haran will want to do a rematch with me. There we go. Yeah, you beat Haran in the finals. Mm-hmm. Call him out. <laughs> no, it was semifinals. A semifinal. David Avalon. Oh, David Avalon was a final. Yeah, David Avalon was a final. So I mean, obviously, you know, you made you made a name for yourself in the UFC by by you know winning the Ultimate Fighter season four, uh, and then you got a title shot versus Anderson Silva, and um, obviously that had a, had the twist to it that you, you failed to make weight, and uh, that the fight was on a three round non title fight. But I think what people remember most about that was that you put it on them pretty good. How, how, how do you remember that fight? Um, you know, do uh, you want me to describe the fight? Or yeah, well, I, it's just, you know, I remember watching it live. I mean, I, I actually remember. I went down to, I was in Vancouver working at EA Sports, and we went down to Seattle for a Seattle Sonics game. Yeah. The whole NBA Live team. I was working on NBA Live, the basketball game. And on the way back, we stopped at one of those, you know, those uh, those roadside truck stops, whatever, to grab a burger or something. And I checked my phone, and it and it was like it's no longer a title fight. Travis failed to make weight. It's yeah. just a three round middleweight fight, and, and everybody was like, they were bummed, man. We were just, you know, yeah. we, we were stoked for the fight, you know, because it looked like you were bringing something new to the table that Anderson hadn't really faced in right. UFC. So there was that initial disappointment. Then you came out. And, uh, I mean, we can definitely talk about, you know, the, what happened with the weight cut. Um, but then you, you, you brought the fight to him. And uh, I remember everybody, you know, I, I would always host the UFCs at my place and people were jumping around because we were happy to see that finally somebody was giving this guy a test. Yeah. So what happened with the weight cut and how, how do you recollect this fight? Um, the weight cut, you know, it's like that was my sixth fight in a calendar year. And uh, I never fought that much. Uh, I fought uh, Pele in London uh, about 12 months before that. And then I fought in Fort Worth. And then I went on the Ultimate Fighter. And I had two fights there, or three fights there, three fights on there. And then I fought uh, Anderson a year later. And I think I was just a little bit burned out from uh, cutting weight. I just, you know, it's like that, that weight cut was a little bit tough for me. And it's like I cut from 200 and about five pounds to fight uh uh, in the finals of the Ultimate Fighter against Patrick Cote, and I thought I could make it from you know a dehydrated to 210 pounds. <laughs> now, at that time, did you have a nu- nutrition coach? Like no, what? nobody did that. There was exactly. there was there wasn't you know it's like you got to keep in mind it's like I was fighting for twenty thousand dollars. You know, it's like, it was, you know, it's like... Uh, so you fought Anderson for 20 Gs? $20,000, <laughs> yes. yes. Best like, dude in the world. Oh, it was 10 and 10, wasn't it? No, it was, was 20 and 20. 20. It was 10 and 10 before 20. that, yeah. It was 20, 20 and 20. Is it was right. It's like, so there was no money to pay a nutritionist. There was, it's like, you know, why didn't you go to a camp? Well, I had a gym to run so that I could feed my family because that 20 grand, oh. that's not going to pay. That's not going to, it's like, what, what's that going to do for, to feed my, uh, yeah. you know, to feed my family and make money for me? It's like, so it's like, it was just a different time. You know, it's like, there wasn't, you know, the guy, the guys are making a lot more money now. It's like, I don't know what Anderson made that night. I'm sure it was much more than me, but it's like, that's what I was getting paid. And uh, so... Oh. As far as <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a that's a rough number to wake well, up they, for. Well, for they, that, they, that they took ten percent of it. Keep in mind, they took they took uh, uh, Anderson. Got yeah, 10% Anderson got my ten percent. Uh, you know, since I missed weight. So. How did you feel physically when you walked into the cage? Though I felt okay. You know, I didn't feel great or anything. Because did they like try that. to make you? How much did you miss weight by? I think it was, it was a couple like pounds, pounds yeah. or something like that. The final one though was a pound and a half. Yeah, I think yeah. you were eighty six on the first one eighty six point five. Yeah, it was eighty six point five at the final yeah. weight. I don't know the the whole weight cup process. The last four hours was very very foggy, uh, as far as like what I remember and stuff like that. That that was you know kind of out of it. Uh, you know, as far as fight day, it's like I felt okay. You know, it's like I, I you never fell you know amazing fight day after cutting that much weight and stuff yep. like that but it's like uh, I felt good enough to go out and beat, and beat him and I thought I would so you know yeah you had him in trouble at some times I remember that that was a that, you know that and that's what I remember you by and then when I, like I said when I saw your poster at Tiger Wu Tai like sweet man this this guy he's the first dude to, to bring it to Anderson uh, no okay now let, let's fast forward to today and the recent scandal involving Anderson him being defeated you know brutally twice by by Chris Weidman Again, in hindsight, what, what do you think of this scandal of him getting popped for, for steroids? Um, I always was, I didn't think he was one, I thought he was one of the guys, 
you know, BJ Penn in about 2005, 2006, you know, said that everybody was on steroids. Yep. And it's like, I read the article and I go, okay, there's two guys on, not on steroids, me and BJ. Um, you know, and it's like, and that was, you know, a joke I told him amongst uh, some buddies of mine. Uh, and we laughed and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it, but it's like, you know, I knew that there was a whole bunch of truth to it. I didn't think Anderson was one of them. Now, with that being said, I don't believe him. You know, it's like he, he, him getting popped the way he did. It's like uh, um, his answers afterwards. Uh, it's like if he would have came out and said, you know, listen, I was, you know, after the fight, uh, after I broke my leg, I, I, my doctors told me to take this and blah, 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 and, and, and lied that way instead of lying and saying that he, he didn't take it. That would be a, that was a big difference. So no, I, I believe that, you know, he, he was probably juicing the whole time. It's like his body didn't change. He's not any thicker. He's not, it's like he looked, you know, his body looked basically the same as he's looked for the last 15 years. Yeah, he hasn't um, aged. Yeah, it's like he's not aging. Uh, and it's like, so I just, I think without a doubt that he's, he was probably juicing the whole time, you know, which would make sense. You know, yeah. it's like the guy was dominant, man. He was good. Very good. Um, and that makes Chris Weidman altogether very impressive as well. Yeah, well, how, I mean, how was your, what was your reaction when he knocked my, him out that first fight? My opinion about that is, is Anderson's chin was gone before that. You know, it's like that's not the same Anderson Silva that was fighting in, you know, the mid two thousands. You know, it's like uh, when Chael knocked him down. Chael's got zero knockouts in his career. He fought thirty sometimes or something like yep. that. He had zero knockouts. I don't think I've ever saw him knock anybody else down. Let alone and, Anderson. And, and, let alone Anderson Silva. Anderson Silva, it's like Jorge Rivera fought him and uh, we were talking about him and it's like cause you know on in the house we were talking about Anderson. He goes, Listen, Anderson Silva, I fought him in cage rage and he goes, I caught him flush. I hit him as hard as I could and he looked at me and smiled, and I said, fuck. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, yeah, man. that was the end of the fight. And he Jorge goes, Rivera hits hard. Jorge's man. got a good chin. Yeah. Jorge, had, I don't think true Jorge had ever had a good chin after that fight, but Jorge had a really, really good chin, and he hit hard. I mean, it's like yeah. Jorge was good, and it's like, you know, it's like that, and then you got Chael Sonnen, you know, not taking anything away yep. from Chael. You know, Chael's really good athlete. It's really not like his bread fighter. and butter, though. Yeah, yeah, but that wasn't his thing. And it's like when he knocked Anderson Silva down, it's like he got hurt by somebody else, too, once I thought, where um, where I thought I saw it when he was fighting, and I thought he got hurt. And it's like, so for not taking anything away from Wiedemann, but it's like I, 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 I don't, that's, he didn't beat the best Anderson Silva because that Anderson Silva, everybody gets old. You know, it's like, it's yep. like arguing, it's basically like arguing, well, I beat Muhammad Ali. You know, Larry Holmes says, I beat Muhammad Ali in 1980. Well, sorry, that, that yeah. Muhammad Ali isn't the same guy that was in 1964. Yeah. <laughs> Gravity and age do their, uh, do their traumatizing work, don't they? Good Lord. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, and I, I didn't think Edison Silva looked uh, looked all that good against Nick Diaz either. I thought that was a bit of a glorified sparring match. You, you know, know I mean, coming back after that fight, after that I mean, that break, break, impressive. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's like that, that, was, that, was, that was good. Diaz, I thought, looked worse. I, I mean, it's like, you know, it's I like, agree. what the heck? You know, it's like his, his punch count and stuff. Usually, you know, he's throwing about twice as many punches per round. Uh, you know, this is a guy that, you know, it's like I, I didn't understand his strategy. And it's like I read an interview or I listened to an interview where he talked about he thought he won the fight. And it's like, how? You need to. I agree. And I find that the Diaz brothers, they're two of my favorite fighters of all time. I think Diaz, Nick Diaz's fight. They're uh, hard Nick to Diaz like, against. They're hard uh, to like. Yeah, but Nick Diaz versus Takanori Gomi at Pride 33. I don't know if you saw that fight. It was one that took place in LA. Uh, in uh, Las, wait, uh, in Las Vegas, wait, 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 Gomi? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's top three of my favorite MMA fights. Yeah, of all that time. was a good fight. You know, Gomi was never the same after that fight. Yeah, and he, yeah, and, yeah, and he'd already been been rattled a bit in Pride just before. But yeah. I mean, I love Gomi. I love that era of 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 Nick Diaz. But him and his brother, I find that you know their signature is the volume output, the offensive yeah. output, mm-hmm. and in. Both of their last, I don't know, three or four fights, the guys, they spend more time telling the other dude to punch them in the face than they spend punching the dudes. They're, they're just getting the old. They're getting old, and it's like, you know, it's like you're starting to slow down. They're not as fast as they once were. Yep. And 
you know, it's like Anderson's still fast. That's the crazy thing is, is Anderson's still still fast. Diaz didn't look fast in the fight, and, and he there was a time when he was fast. And it's like, and that's the biggest thing in MMA, as far as I'm concerned, is, is once you start to lose speed, it, it's like with those little gloves. It's it's I think it's a bigger deal than in boxing. Yeah. And then the other thing is, is the you know, it's like the MMA fighters still don't have the same level of boxing hand skills that that the boxers do and it's like so you know it's like you know roy jones jr just knocked out a guy and uh in his last uh um boxing fight he knocked he's like what is he 46 47 years old now and it's like and, and the guy the guy beat you know is legit i mean it's like that's you know that's where you talk phenom like where, you, where the guy's got a real well genetic gift right yo yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, it, the, I think the biggest thing with him is, is, you know, it's like he, he never, he was so gifted in his prime that he, did, he didn't have to box. It's like somebody like Bernard Hopkins, Bernard Hopkins had to box. And it's like, and that's how, why he was so successful for so long. I mean, that guy's 50 years old and still winning titles. And or I think he just lost, he lost, just lost a title, but it was like a title that was taken from him in a fight. Uh, and he's 50 years old, but that guy boxes. You know, it's like they fought in 1992. Uh, Roy Jones Jr. and uh, Bernard Hopkins fought at, at uh, like Super Middle, I think. Uh, and it's like, you know, think about that. That's a long time ago. That's 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 uh, 22 years ago. Yep. 23 years ago. 23 years ago. It's pretty. It's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, for myself, uh, I'm I'm no athlete, and uh, I've come out to Tiger Muay Thai and into this road here to train, and, and you know, and you do a little bit of sparring, and you take little shots, and you see that just just when you're pity patty punching, the damage you can take, and you think that there's some guys who are fighting for 20, 30, 35 years. It's, it's yeah. insane. Yeah, it's, it's insane. You're just like yeah. how how is it possible that some bodies can handle that wear and tear? Is you know Bernard has a little bit of a because he spent some time in jail, so he didn't get to fight in some of his prime years. We're just probably fighting in there too. <laughs> you no, know, I mean probably, but it's probably not as much damage. Uh, you know, without the without the weight of the glove, when you're fighting with the uh, bare hands, it's that you don't do near as much damage. That's why it's like in the beginning of UFCs, it's like watching the beginning of UFCs. You didn't see any knockouts. Yep. And it's like that glove, you know, taping up your hand and putting that pad on there, and that little bit of centrifugal force that, that glove hit. You hit a lot harder, in my opinion, yep. than you do with a bare hand. So it's like you probably didn't sustain too much brain damage. So, so you guys got your gyms. Uh, why don't we talk a bit about that? What what are what are your courses? What what are people coming to you guys for? We both uh, teach jujitsu, uh, muay thai, and MMA. Okay. And we got adults, kids. Um, my my stats are around you know that seventy five percent adults, twenty five percent kids. We're closer to 50-50. We live in an area that's got a lot of kids, a lot of families, so it's a lot of fun. Yeah, That's actually an interesting topic. Let's, let's dwell on that a little bit. Um, what, what do you guys think about that? When, for, for kids, how, how can they enter correctly and safely into martial arts? What would you recommend? What age and, and what disciplines? Man, we start teaching them at four years old. Yeah, I think you actually start. We three still have a three-year-old class. Yeah, you some the little ones. You know, it's like... And and it's like Mine, they're they're learning jujitsu. His, they're learning you know more, and Muay Thai. Yeah, jujitsu and Muay Thai. Uh, so it's like, you know, at that, that age, I think it's perfectly safe. I think it's great for them. Okay. You know, it's like at that age, you know, parents don't even have a lot of options on what they can put them in there because they're too young for soccer. They're you know, uh, they might be able to start being on dance or something like that. But there's just not very many sports. It's when they get older, they get more sports and stuff like that. So then there's. You know, but these, you know, we're not going to have them sparring. You know, it's like they're not going to be putting on gloves and getting hit in the head and stuff like that. Do you guys have time to go to a Thai, Muay Thai fight when you're out here? Oh, yeah. We've done it before. Yeah. yeah it's because they get, them, they get them going pretty young. Yeah, they get them going yeah, young. That's here. a little bit different. <laughs> a little, a little different. different. Yeah, a little and, bit different. Uh, Our kids they, are on Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> and they even get the, 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 the ladies going young here, man. I mean, uh, I, last week when I was out here, I went to a bunch of fights. I didn't see any girls fight. But this, this time, there was literally girls. I mean, seven, eight year old girls fighting. I'm really against kids getting hit in the head till they're like, uh, you know, it's like I understand in boxing and stuff, you've got you've got to have kids getting hit in the head. But they've done the studies that you know, like the the football and the soccer. Yep. Uh, these kids getting hit in the head with, by soccer balls using their head. Um, they, they've decided that um, since the brain's the brain's not fully fun, formed until you're like 21 years old. It doesn't cement into your brain, into your skull and stuff like that because it's still growing and changing and stuff like that. Um, and so that these kids, until that age, you know, hitting the soccer ball with their head can, can ca cause concussions, 
playing high school football, lots of concussions. And these kids, they, they end up with brain damage. And so it's like, yeah. my kid, you know, my kids aren't going to spar. You know, it's like, if you know, you need to at least wait till you're, you know, I, I would hope they wait till 21, but it's like once they turn 18. But as a kid, I'm not going to have them doing that. Now, do you find that it's, who's motivated to come to these classes? Is it the parents that want their kids to learn self-defense at a young age? Or are these kids showing up, hey, daddy, I saw something on TV, or I read a comic book, and there's some ninjas and some karatekas? Or like, More parents' self-defense for me. Poor, you know, there's a little bit of the kids, you know, hopefully that's where, the, where it ends up, where the kids are dragging the parents to class, but it's mostly the parents are wanting to, you know, it's, and, it, and it's really less about jujitsu and more about all the other things that martial arts gives the kids, you know, respect, discipline, um, confidence, confidence, you know, maybe a bit stuff. of spirituality. Uh, we don't do too much of that. Yeah. So we do more of the, you know... Um, but, but you see a big change with the kids with confidence and, you know, bowling's such a huge problem and it's cool to see these kids that, you yeah. know, the, the kind of dorky kid who probably got picked on a lot gets a little bit of confidence and it just changes his whole life. And, and he they might just want to play different. a different sport. Yeah, they walk, they walk different, different. They carry you know, themselves like, different. When they start walking different, all of a sudden they become, it, it, it's like becoming less of a victim. You know, it's like if you can teach a kid not to be a victim, you've won because people are, you know, why do the same people keep, keep getting mugged? It's like, it's like <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying it's their fault, but it's, like, it's a lot of the, you know, it's like, it's, you know. You got marked for a reason. <laughs> right, you got marked, you know, it's like, why do, why can, you know, me and Paul walk around a lot of the world and, you know, it's like I've been in lots of different places, been to Brazil, been to here, and not get mugged. Yep. You know, I mean, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I mean, heck, they, they, they mugged, you know, some fighter in Brazil. I mean, it's like, they got a gun and I don't, you know, they win, but, uh, but it's still, there's easier people to get money from them. Yeah, I mean, it's a confidence and it's an aura that's going to radiate entirely from your persona. That, right. You know, that's just yeah. And so if you, can that, man. <laughs> if you can give that to kids, yeah. you know, give that to kids so that they feel confident, and uh, you know, and some kids aren't going to mess up them. You know, that, that's that's important. No, it's cool. That must be a and that must be a rewarding feeling. You know, oh, yeah. To know that you're helping oh, forge cool. some forge some kids to just be stronger, you know, physically, mentally. Yeah. Excellent. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you guys. Uh, how can people stay in touch with you guys on social media? Uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, Travis Litter. Um, and I'm on Instagram, Travis Litter again. Uh, same thing on Facebook, thing. Instagram, Paul. Only. Twitter, okay. stuff like that. You know, Do you, like, are you guys pretty active on there? I, I am more... Yeah. More than I am more for my school. I don't yeah, do a bunch of personal stuff. I'd I still do some, but I do a lot of school promotions and stuff like that. And okay. I can go on like this trip. We'll do some video stuff. Um, we've got a couple different social media projects we do. We co-founded the Jiu-Jitsu Life, which is a basically a page about Jiu-Jitsu and just living the Jiu-Jitsu life. We've got 150,000 yeah, fans yeah, right fans now. So, you know, it's, just, it's cool. So we'll do a video while we're out here. Just kind of, because Jiu-Jitsu has changed a lot. It changes a lot of lives. It's changed mine, you know. It, Travis is what got him started too. So it's like we basically yeah. created that, and and then one thing we're working on too, we're doing you know Travis is doing different projects and talk a lot, but doing software. You know, we're building an app. Um, Excellent. What's your uh, what's your you know I've been involved in software for fifteen we're, we're, years. We but. designed it out of a frustration, almost in a way, and then some cool stuff we added to it. So we're building an app, um, basically for like starting off with like jujitsu students, how you log your training, log your ranks, basically store everything in the cloud, so then you never lose your data, so you can have like what. Day you got your second stripe on your blue belt okay. you know what what class did you do march 5th 2004 you know the hard save everything so it's a really cool app we'll have videos and everything like that and so we've been developing that it's been a long project running going on a year and a half now yeah, development. Year and a half. So, listen my friend i'm very uh, I'm intimately aware of the, <laughs> it's you know, the suffering and the, the delays of software development yeah. it's uh it's a brutal process and people think you know they see 20 million apps out there and a million video games this and that and people have no effing clue oh, how we, what it takes to make these games yeah. the grueling process oh, we, that it is we started storyboarding this app a year and a half ago i couldn't imagine what yeah. making a game would take it'd be it unreal is, but it's pretty cool it's like yeah. the way that if it you know if it, once it's done and we get to see the final product we've saw the the product along the way in the development stages and it's it's very very cool and i think you know uh that it'll you know hopefully be helpful for people and stuff like that so it's that's excellent. I had no clue you guys were working on that. If you, if you encounter any difficulties and you, and you need some some good additional resources or anything, let, let me know. I, I know a lot of people in the in the business. I was okay. in the in the Thank trenches you. there for fifteen years. So if, you know cool. if you need some uh, external feedback on it or some impartial feedback or external design, it would be awesome. Awesome. But that's great. That's great. I, 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 see, these are the stories I like to hear. That um, 
you know, you guys have been competing, you've been fighting, you, there's the wear and tear and you're finding ways and uh, of staying current and keeping these multiple revenue streams open. And, you know, having social media is super important and having your own app, it's a great way of promoting your brand. You know, yeah. it's a great way of getting your message out there, getting your services out there and connecting with people. Yeah. You know, people live on their phones with these apps. Man. Yeah, it's what, else we, what else are we starting? Yeah, I, yeah, I saw you hesitate there. Yeah, I, I went, okay, it's funny because you people think about like Travis, like, oh, where's Travis been? He's been fighting anymore. It's like between him and I, we're always working on, we create different products. You know, it's like literally using the software development now, um, real estate development. Yeah, real estate. So he does a lot of stuff. It's kind of funny. People think of fighters as not doing a lot, but it's like, you know, it's like you find these different things like developing real estate software. It's yeah. like, it's literally super time consuming, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's just so key to know that there is a life after fighting. And it can be uh, even yeah, one after, better than the life during fighting. Yeah, it's, you know? yeah. Well, it's yeah. sad. You see, you read, you know, we'd go to these fights and Travis would be fighting out corner and talk to different fighters and just meet people and talk to them. And then you fast forward 10 years and you read these horrendous stories where they're living on their mom's couch and they can't yep. do anything because they put their whole life into the UFC. The ultimate fighter, it's like, you know, in the house, you know, it's like the first week we're there, it's like a payday came along. You know, so it's like you're, yep. you're deciding on, you know, uh, how you're going to, you know, it's like, okay, well, you get a check. Okay, well, what do you want? Oh, uh, you, you know, it's like there was two guys on the show that, you know, it's like, okay, you know, uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll just, you, you just keep it, I'll just, you can just give it all to me at the end. There's two of us. And then it's like, and then there was everybody else. And it's like, and I would guess that that situation's not that different than, you know, it is now. It's like, I remember Shoney Cardi. Carter, it's like, okay, baby mama number one gets this much, baby mama number two gets this much, baby number three. It's like he probably left that place as broke as he walked in. So did you get paid to be on the show? Of course. Okay, I didn't I didn't realize that. Yeah, of course you get you gotta So when you compete on the Ultimate Fighter, they cut you a paycheck. Oh yeah. We well, got a weekly okay. check and then yeah, a, a weekly check and, and then you check. got your fight checks too. Okay. Yeah, but it wasn't massive money. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's like a thousand bucks a week. No, the way they sort of, I mean, I guess, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I've never even thought of that. If you're just getting paid to be on the show, it seems sort of like, the, hey, we're going to put you up in this house. It's full of booze and a swimming pool and a bunch of goons. And we'll try to get you on the big show, you know, if right. you, but you don't really hear that side of the story where, okay, uh, you are actually being paid to be there. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're being paid right. to be there. And it's like, you, you've got to get paid. Everybody's got bills and stuff like yeah. that. You know, yeah, like, they're taking you away from work. Right, they're taking sure. you away from work, and yeah. it's like so you got to get paid. You and know? especially at that time, this the show had blown up. Right. So well, yeah, but, but even the first one, it's like our, our our pay. As far as I know, we were getting paid the exact same way as the you know the Ultimate Fighter one. It's, it's probably like, still the same. It's probably, probably the same. <laughs> it's probably the same contract. It's like, yeah, but they gave a chick a belt, man. They gave Carla Esparza a belt for winning it. Yeah, and I bet you, she, you know, and I, 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 former yeah, former yeah. this week. You know, that girl was insanely dude. Good. That was a gnarly fight. I didn't see it. She got picked it. apart on the feet. It, frankly, my comparison was it was like a a slightly lesser version of Rich Franklin versus Anderson Silva one. Yeah, like it was it was a gross mismatch that ended up in, in, in brutal violence and it was between two women, you know, and they're like hundred and twenty five pounds. It, it was kinda hard to watch at the end. I was like, there, please uh, stop this fight. The 118th? This 118th. Yeah, it's the straw, it's a super yeah, one eighteenth. Uh no, sorry, they're uh one fifteen. Oh, yeah, one fifteen, yeah. Little Yeah. Angry. Little little women. But hey man, that that Polish chick yeah, Joanna or her yeah, name's pronounce. not the easiest thing to pronounce, but uh, yeah, I think she put the fear of God in that division. <laughs> yeah. You know, because I, I mean, I watched it, they, they, they did a nice little uh, open workouts video for yeah. UFC 185, and Carla looked good on it. She was just ragdolling her trainer, like just throwing this guy around like a sack of shit. It was hilarious. And I was like, man, that pole chick, she's going to get taken down and get beaten within an inch of her life, and it just didn't go down that way. She didn't I get that I heard memo. she got tagged uh, really early on, yep. took, a, took a punch really, really early, and just never could find a groove yep. after that, is what I read. Same thing happened with Pettis against Rafael yeah. Lozano. Yeah, he, he, I think he was saying afterwards that uh, he got uh, he lost. They said he couldn't person. see, yeah. yeah couldn't after see. the first punch? Yeah, after that. Yeah, I think he took a tough guy to keep going, can't see. yeah. yeah. <laughs> You kind of see, you know. yeah. It's but it's, I think that that fight, you know, regardless, was probably going to end up that way. That guy's good. Yeah, yeah. He's he's got a, he's got a really cool story, Dos Anjos. I mean, he came into the UFC zero and two. You know, he got knocked out by uh, it was a Jeremy. 
That was Jeremy in the UFC. Stevens. That was in the UFC. In the UFC, Jeremy the Stevens UFC. knocked him out with like a Street Fighter Two type mm-hmm. uppercut from the center of the octagon, and then he got his no his jaw broken by Clay Guida. So he went zero and two. Then he went four and four, and now he can lay claim to having beat Donald Cerrone, Anthony Pettis. And Ben Henderson, which is pretty much that weight class. It's like they're so competitive. That's like the like, holy trinity of the WEC lightweights that yeah, moved over to yeah. the UFC, and I've been running that that division yeah, since that, then. That division's tough, though. It's like everybody in there's so good. You know, it's I mean, like, there are a lot of good ones, though. I mean, middleweight, your former division yeah. is looking nice right now. I mean, you've got Hector Lombard. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> another. Another dude who just got pot for juicy, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, Rory McDonald. Uh, no wait, that's one seventy. Uh, no, you got uh, Evel Romero. You got Jacare, Gegard Musasi, Machida, Luke Rockhold. Uh, uh, Musasi just lost to. Uh, no, he just beat Jan Henderson. But he beat. He got. He yeah. lost to Machida before that. He lost to Jacare before that. Jacare. Yeah, Jacare submitted him. Yeah, Jacare submitted him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So but like then he came back and because yeah. Masali beat him in Pride. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I mean, so I see knocked yeah, out Jacare with a with a up, up kick. kick. Yeah, he was on his back. Caught him. That was. I mean, he went on a run. Masali and Pride. It was in uh, yeah. in Dream. It was in Dream. He uh, yeah he flattened uh, Melvin yeah, Manoff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dennis Kang and Jacare to win what that. Uh, Dennis Kang. Just yeah, lost a bunch of fights. He's, he's probably in the Philippines. I think he's part Filipino or something. But he's Canadian. He's, he's, he's Canadian. Yeah. He's but he's, Canadian. Yeah, but he's, yeah. he's yeah. Canadian, yeah. But, and they like, loved him. I think he was making movies. Or no, it's Korea. Korea. Yeah, yeah, he's real, Korea. Real, real yeah. famous in Korea. They'll try to get Dennis Kang on the show. I haven't heard of him for yeah, a while. Yeah, he was on a tear for a while. And then, but yeah, that I happens. think he retired. Yeah. yeah, it's been years. I wouldn't be surprised. I haven't, I haven't heard of him fighting for a while. Actually, maybe he did fight quite recently. We'll check it out after. Crazy. Well, guys, it's been awesome, and I'm sure we could talk for hours. It's great to talk to a, a real veteran, and, and Travis, I'm glad to see you're doing well, that you're feeling healthy and uh, staying busy and, 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 and living life after fighting, man. Thank you. Thank you Excellent. very much. Thanks for coming out. Thank, Thank you. you. Paul, it was a pleasure. Good luck Thank with you your endeavors as well, guys. This was the Trash Talk MMA Podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelletier, with my guest, UFC middleweight contender, former UFC middleweight contender, Travis Luter, and winner of the Ultimate Fighter Four, and Paul Halmy, Jiu-Jitsu ace. Peace. I don't want to hear it. Thanks for listening to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. Be sure to visit TrashTalkMMA.com. And don't forget to follow Antoine on Twitter at Trash Talk MMA. Let us know you're listening. Use hashtag Trash Talk MMA. Welcome to Trash Talk MMA. Smile my face behind my back and talk trash. The number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. Brought to you live and unfiltered from all four corners of the globe by MMA aficionado Antoine Pelchay. Yo, and welcome to the Trash Talk MMA Podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche, and today I have two distinguished guests, Mr. Travis Luter, former UFC middleweight contender and winner of the Ultimate Fighter Season 4, and Jiu-Jitsu ace, Paul Halmy. How you doing, guys? Doing good. Doing good. Excellent. What brings, uh, what brings you fine gentlemen to, uh, to Phuket, Thailand? Uh, we, uh, we were supposed to film a documentary with Stuart Cooper. Uh, and then, uh, and then the other thing that we're doing is doing seminars and then sightseeing. So, excellent. So, what was the what's the basis of this documentary? Is it something that's been in the work for for a while? Uh, we've talked about it on and off, you know, over the years and stuff like that. And it's just a jujitsu documentary, I guess, on me. Yeah, uh, your jujitsu history. Yeah, my jujitsu history. There you go. Okay. Yeah, it's funny you brought up Stuart Cooper because I was just uh, a lot of the Tiger Muay Thai guys have have some promotional videos done by him, and, yeah. and, and they're really slick pieces of work. Where, where is he based out of? England. He's based out of England. Okay. Yeah, I like his work. I'd like to. Uh, I'll be curious to see when he gets that done and check that out. So Travis, um, I'm not gonna lie, man. When I was walking around, you know, Tiger Muay Thai, and I saw that uh, you were coming to do a seminar, I was. Uh, you gotta think back. It's like I was 24 years old, and and uh, uh, well, 1993. I guess I would have been 20, 20 years old, 21 years old when the first yeah. UFC came out. 
you know, it's like by the time I moved to Texas, I was 24 years old. Yeah, it's like my heroes, you know, it's like I didn't grow up with MMA heroes. I, I, I like boxing. I read a lot about boxing and stuff like that uh, um, as a kid. But in South Dakota, there's no place to box. Uh, you know, so I never, you know, so I wrestled. And it, it wasn't about, you know, it was just, you know, it was about, you know, I remember when Mike Tyson won the world championship and when I was in high school, he was 18 or 19 years old, I think 19 years old when yep. he won the yeah, heavyweight yeah. world championship. And it's like, okay, that's who I want to be. I want to be like that. And that, that was my motivation. I wanted to be the toughest man alive because that was who I it was. Like Mike. Like, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, we all can recall those those good old days, and that's really when boxing was, you know, was the shit. That's when yeah. people were really excited no. to tune in. No, nineteen no. seventies. This, you know, the, yeah, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali is like this is before our time and stuff like that. And I think that's the the golden age of boxing was the seventies. It's like okay. you had two undefeated champions fighting each other, and uh, um, in uh, Muhammad Ali and uh, Joe Frazier. In 19, what was that, 1972, 1971, uh, and it's like, you know, it's like there were two, the two guys, it's like, that were undefeated, going out there and, you know, plowing into each other, and Joe Frazier knocking him down in the 14th round, or 15th round, yeah. 15th yeah. round, uh, went in the fight, and then, uh, you know, going on to lose the fight to George Foreman. Uh, I was pleased because it's been a long time since I've had any any news from you. What's uh, what's been keeping you busy since uh, you know since you've retired from MMA? Uh, just you know, training jiu-jitsu, uh, running my gyms, uh, doing that stuff. You know, we go to we go to a bunch of tournaments over the course of the year. You know, we always go to Worlds, uh, the Adult Worlds. We always go to. Masters Worlds, we always go to Nogi Worlds, uh, and then you know a bunch of other tournaments that we go to. So we follow the Jiu-Jitsu scene pretty close, and uh, you know, and stay involved in that. Okay. Um, so you're out here doing a, a seminar at Tiger Muay Thai as well. Yes. That's going to happen this afternoon. Uh, what, what takes place in those, and what's uh, what are your individual roles, Travis and Paul? I'm just going to go out there, and uh, I'll probably you know start off you know make introductions. Uh, you know, remind people who I am, and then uh, we'll probably work some passing the guard, uh, you know, mixing in some strikes along the way, and then we'll, once we go to the guard, um, pass the guard, then we'll, you know, probably gonna work the way that I hold the back and try to work my finishes from there. Um, and then if we cover all that in the two hours, then we'll probably uh, um, add in what I do from the guard from an MMA perspective, you know, and, uh, on the way that I play and stuff like that. So. Okay, so it's definitely a jiu-jitsu class tailored for usage in MMA? Yes. Okay. All right, so speaking of, uh, speaking with Paul earlier when we were when we just got here, you mentioned that you'd, you know, you'd cornered Travis in a lot of his fights, and one thing I sort of wanted to, to revisit was that uh, you didn't have the longest MMA career, uh, 16 fights, but you had a lot of notable names on your, you know, on your yeah, resume. It wasn't ever about, you know, weight classes and stuff like that it's a, it's a you know it's a different feel when you're talking to the modern generation you're talking about you know it's like I started doing MMA you know shortly after the UFC you know it's like I think the first UFC was in 1993 yep. Uh, yep. 1993 and it's like 22, uh, yeah 22 years old yeah and it's like I fought in UFC 50 and we're at one, UFC 185 or something like that now that's a that's a lot of evolution a lot of different changes and stuff like that you know so it's like uh you know, uh, the goal was to be, you know, like Coyce Gracie and fight everybody. That That's a great segue for what I want to talk about next. Uh, you, you entered the world of fighting through wrestling. Uh, you've wrestled since you're 12, correct? Mm, yeah, I think 12. Yeah. Okay. And then it seems that once you saw Coyce Gracie fight, that your fascination turned to jujitsu quite quickly. Yeah, I was done with wrestling then. So what is it you saw there that, 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 that fired that up in you? It was just he was beating wrestlers that were better than I was at the time. Uh, you know, it's like uh, you got a big, you know, it's like when he beat Dan Severin. You yep. know, it's like Dan Severin's a big, really, really decorated wrestler that, you know, it's like this is, you know, his, his best years in wrestling were behind him. But he was still just a beast and a big, big man. And it's like, and Hoist caught him at around 12 or 15 minutes into the fight and he caught him in that triangle. Um, that was, you know, it's like that was a motivation, you know, it's like, okay, I want to do that. And it's like, um, you know, so that, that was my goal. 
So, I mean, as a kid, was it something that you saw that you saw, like, fascinated with, I guess, perhaps smaller guys beating up bigger guys? No, I mean, you, know? you didn't see that. You know, it's like, you know, you, <laughs> yeah, so, you, know, you fight Jorge Rivera, Marvin Eastman, Matt Lindlin, Trevor Prangley, uh, Pele, Patrick Cote, Rich Franklin, and, of course, uh, the great Anderson Silva. Yeah. How was it? Uh, what was it like being in the corner for some of these fights, Paul? Well, it was cool. It was a cool experience. One thing about Travis, he didn't take easy fights where a lot of guys would. No, I mean, he was one of those are. You know, so it makes for an interesting career, and it was a lot of fun. I got to see a lot of cool things and take part of a lot of really cool training camps, and then the fights, of course, you know, were amazing. Now, Travis, is this something that you wanted to do right out the gate when you got into MMA? Did you want to take big fights right away? I mean, you got thrown into some pretty deep waters pretty quick. You got to remember, it's like I started biting. My first fight was in 1998, uh, and that's, you know, I, I don't know when they started doing weight classes, but I think it was... Yeah, after that, that they started adding in, into the UFC weight classes, and it's like you know, at first they only had the 205 pound weight class and stuff like that, and then uh, um, by the time I made it to the UFC, that's 2004, um, you know, then they had you know 170, 185, and 205 weight classes, but that's all they had at that time, you know. So it was a, you know, it was a lot different. I just wanted to fight, you know. It's like my my original goal was to, to be. You know, 185 pound, but world champion. My, my, I wanted to be the toughest man alive. You know, and then uh, over the course of the few years, you go, okay, I'm not quite big enough to be the toughest man alive, so I'll be whatever weight class I can fight at. Yep. And I fought at 205, I fought at 185. Um, you know, I competed in jujitsu against you know um, the really, really big guys. So it's like the the goal was always just to to just be the best. That was that was. Uh, 